Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose, arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuke, and he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, not only did Jesus heal Peter's mother-in-law from this high fever, but later that evening many were sick with all kinds of diseases, and their family, their friends, brought them to Jesus to be healed, and he heals them. You think, well, how could he do that? Because he's God. He, ha he has power over disease. He has power over demons. Matthew chapter 9. For those of you that have new Bibles, you're thankful that we're going all over the place, so you break them in. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 1. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw the, their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemies. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Now, there's a couple points in this story regarding Jesus being all-powerful, but the one we're going to focus on here is about the paralytic man, he, a man who couldn't walk, and yet Jesus heals him. Heals him, so he stands up and he walks away. I mean, keep in mind, his friends had to carry him to Jesus, but now he leaves on his own power because Jesus healed him. He's all-powerful. Well, not only that, but Jesus has the power to forgive sins. And regarding this same story, we're going to turn over to Mark chapter 2. Because here's the second point regarding this story. And this is, I guess, important for us. In Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men, his friends. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof of where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Now, here's the thing. From a human perspective, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or stand up and walk? Your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because there's no way to prove that they're not, right? From a human perspective. It's a lot harder to say, I'm going to have this person stand up and walk. Because they have to actually do it, right? So these scribes were upset with Jesus because he says, look, son, your sins are forgiven. So, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Only God can forgive sins. This is blasphemy. How could this man, how could Jesus say this person's sins are forgiven? Well, Jesus, showing that he is God, heals this man proving that he can forgive this man's sins, that he's all-powerful. He healed him physically, showing that he can heal him spiritually also. 
Well, we, we dealt a little bit with this one the last time, that Jesus has power over demons. Absolutely. Now turn over to Luke chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 31. Where we're told this. And keep in mind that as Christians, can we cast out demons? Absolutely. But where does our power come from? From God. Can we heal the sick? Absolutely. But it's not because of us, it's because of Him. It's according to His will. So it's not about us, it's about Him. But again, in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 31, notice what we're told. Then He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and He was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in, the, when the demon had thrown him in their midst, they came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is th this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And they report about him, and the report about him went out to every place in the surrounding region. You know, isn't it interesting? The demons know who Jesus is, right? That he's God, that he is all powerful, and they said, You know, just leave us alone, man. But he cast this demon out of this man. And it's the end of it, because he's all-powerful. He's able to cast out demons from people. I mean, even James says that the demons believe. Does that make them saved? No, they know who Jesus is, that he's Almighty God. They believe that because they were once around him. They were once angels in heaven. But they fell with Lucifer. A third of them listened to the lies of Lucifer, who is Satan, and sided with him and fell. So they know who Jesus is. Believing doesn't make them saved. They just know. It's a belief of knowing. What's in your heart? Is he Lord and Savior of your life? He's not Lord and Savior of their lives. They're not saved. One more, Luke 9.1. I'll just read it to you. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Now isn't that interesting? Who gave the disciples the power to cast out demons and heal all diseases. Jesus did. How could he do that? Because he's God. You see, he's all-powerful. We're not all-powerful. We can't cast out demons by our power or our strength. We can't heal diseases by our power or our strength. It's God who gives us the power to do it. And thus, you know, as we looked at these verses, it's very clear. Another point is Jesus has the power to create. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. You know these verses here, I think. If Jesus is all-powerful, then he has to have the power to create things. And what's the most powerful thing that Jesus has created? All things. You know, that's a cop-out. But that's the reality. He's, the Bible says he's created all things. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 uh, through 17, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. You see, Denying the deity of Jesus was one of the heresies that was spreading through Colossae. And it's the forefront of every cult today. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses in their New World Translation of the Scriptures tell us, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, not over, but of all creation, because by means of Him all other things were created. Not all things, but all other things were created. You know, the word other is not there in the Greek, nor is it implied. Not at all. And again, the Jehovah Witnesses try to prove that Jesus is not God, when in reality, these verses prove that Jesus is God. 
Jesus says he's the image, or Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And the word image in the Greek is ikoni, and it speaks of a statue or representation. In other words, it's as we're told in John chapter 14, where, where Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus says, ha, said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Well, he's the exact representation. If you want to know what God the Father is all about, look at Jesus. Because he is God, God the Son. And the invisible God became visible to us in Jesus Christ when he became flesh and blood, when he dwelt among us, when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, Paul's point is Jesus is God. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses tell us that Jesus was a created being because the scriptures tell us that. They show us what Paul says here, that he is the firstborn over all creation. And they would change the word overall to of to fit their theology, but again, it's not what the Greek is saying. But Jesus was the firstborn, so it must mean that he is a created being in their thinking. The word firstborn in the Greek is prototokos, and it has a couple different meanings. In fact, here's the thing. The rabbis called Yahweh the firstborn of the world. Does that mean God the Father was a created being? No. Well, I'll show you what I mean. Firstborn, chronologically, it can just mean when it's speaking of Jesus in Luke 2, 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Jesus was the firstborn of Mary, okay? She had no other children prior to that. She had children afterwards, but not prior. So it can be chronologically. It could be figuratively. In Exodus 4.22, we're told, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And it can be in a positional sense, this word firstborn. And speaking of the Messiah, God the Father says in Psalm 89.27, Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. In other words, Jesus is the highest of all the kings of the earth. He is supreme to all. He rules supremely. And, you know, if you look at verse 18 of Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that he is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus. And so it has to mean ranking because haven't others been raised from the dead in both the Old and New Testament? Yes. So you can't use it one way to fit your theology and then another way to fit your theology. It's got to be consistent. In fact, you know, as we said, he is the image of God. He rules over all creation because he is God. And so in Colossians 1.15, when it speaks of Jesus being the firstborn, Paul is speaking of ranking, of position, and not that he was a created being. He's always been God, and he's always going to be God. And yes, in the incarnation, he was born through Mary, but he didn't cease from being God. Not at all. And Jesus is not part of creation. He is the creator. And he not only created all things, but by him all things consist. They are held together. There is Calm's law of electricity, and it states, states that light charges repel. And if you ever had a magnet, you know what that's about. And the atom is made up of protons in its nucleus, and they're like charges, and they should repel each other, blow the atom apart, but they don't. And scientists aren't sure really why. They have some ideas, and one of the solutions to the problem is there's atomic glue that holds them together. Well, I, you know what? I don't know if that's really scientific or not. That's another way of saying we really don't know what's holding them together, so it's got to be some kind of glue, and that's ridiculous. I know. And, you know, maybe I should get the Nobel Prize in science because I could be able to answer this question. You know what holds all things together? Jesus does. Oh, you could get it too. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how simple.